right. Let's talk about some networks. Um, most people here on the show will be here for very high quality audio, of course. And in order to gain quality or to pursue the high quality audio, you need to think of the whole chain. And this chain of streaming audio includes a network, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, it's all about streaming audio and how to uh, gain the maximum quality. Well, first let me introduce, I'm Jaap from Alpha Audio. Well, it's on the screen, so I don't need to say that, but um, today we're going to talk about how a network is built, so what you need for a, uh, a decent audio network, and especially audio switches. And we can work with copper cable or even fiber optic cable or uh, power connect, uh, power LAN, it's called, with the electrical grid. Uh, and of course, Wi Fi and what the differences are between Wi Fi and a uh, cable network. So, what is a network build off? First, you need a router, and most of the time, you get your router from your internet provider. And it's called uh, Telenet in Belgium, I think, and you have another. Proximus, yeah. so they deliver you a device, um, uh, it's called a modem router, because it's, a, uh, it's both a modem and a router, and the difference is the modem will connect to the internet provider and the router will distribute all the traffic inside your own network. And you can expand that network with Wi-Fi or with cable, copper cable. And a network consists of a minimum of two devices that can exchange data. So it can be either your uh, 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 router with your phone or your router with uh, your streamer or a streamer with a Nest device. But it can extend to millions of clients. Does it still work? Do you? Oh, oh, I need to be very close. So a network can consist of two devices but also millions of clients. And every client or device gets an IP address. That IP address is unique at a certain point in time in your network. So you can walk in inside your home network with your phone and it will get an IP address and the next day you get a different address. So it's unique at a certain, um, certain point in time. You can build your network with normal Ethernet cables, copper, uh, but you can use Wi-Fi as well or even MOCA, it's called it's, it's coaxial cable. Uh, the, well, the advantage of coaxial cables is that it's very well shielded. Or you can use your own electrical grid. It's called home plug or power LAN. We'll talk about that later a little bit, uh, what the, well, the pros and the cons are between those technologies, but um, every technology has its advantages and disadvantages, of course. But um, yeah, well, Wi-Fi is very easy. It's, uh, you, you can connect, you don't need a wire, you don't need to drill holes in your walls or whatever, but yeah, well, it needs to be implemented very well in order to sound good. And that's the reason why some producers don't use Wi-Fi and others do use Wi-Fi. And ironically enough, most of the time, the cheaper devices have Wi-Fi and the very high-end devices don't use Wi-Fi. Um, by the way, you don't need to use copper cable or ethernet cable for the speeds because honestly, audio uses so little bandwidth that speed is not the issue. It's mostly stability and sound quality. Let's get to that router first because it's a very important device for stability and uh, speed in your network. Of course, you get the box from your internet provider like Proximus or Telenet but they don't give you a very expensive router. They, they want to make money, so they're not gonna give you a high-end router uh, for free use at home. Nothing is free in life, you rent the router, at least in the Netherlands you don't get it, you rent it, either way you pay for it. Uh, but they will not give you a high-end router. The problem is that if your household is like two, three, four, five persons, every person nowadays has at least six devices like a phone, a tablet, a laptop, uh, maybe a set-up box or a TV. It's all connected nowadays. So you end up with 30 or 40 devices in your household. Um, 
if you add smart home devices like lighting or climate control or anything like that, it will get up to 40, 50, 60 devices. And that router has to process all that data. So it's pretty busy. And you need more processing power and more memory in order to get a smooth experience in your network. So with that free box from the internet provider, you will notice at a certain point, it will get slow and unreliable. Well, that's the, we advise you to change the router for your own device and build, or sorry, buy another one, a, a faster, better one, and connect it to the internet to keep your uh, uh, network stable and fast. Last year, we had um, a change in law in the Netherlands that you can use your own router if you want to. The internet provider has to service that and, and you have to be able to use it, uh, otherwise they don't comply to the law. So at the end of the line, uh, the, the router is a, is a key device in your network that needs to be stable and fast and reliable. If you want to extend your network, either wireless or wired, you need extra devices. To extend your wired network, you need a switch. Uh, yeah, well, a switch like this. This is a very expensive one. It's an audio grade switch. We'll talk about that later. Or you place extra access points, Wi-Fi access points. Luckily, these days, the technology to extend your Wi-Fi is becoming better and better. And you have these kind of mesh Wi-Fi kits that you can buy from every big brand, there is a mesh Wi-Fi kit. Uh, it's, it's practically plug and play. So everyone, even my mother, which is who's old and not very technical, can, can install a mesh Wi-Fi kit. With switches, you have two big differences. There is a managed and an unmanaged switch. If you check the specifications online, you will see managed or unmanaged. I advise you to buy an unmanaged switch if you're not really into networking because you will not understand the features and you don't need them most of the time. A little bit about cabling. Um, because, well, on the show you will see all sorts of cables, audio file, power cables, interlinks, analog, digital, speaker cables, and we, I think we all agree that there is a difference in cabling, a sound difference. Uh, with networking, it's the same, but a little bit less drastical. Uh, drastic. There is a sound difference. And it has mostly to do with the way it's shielded. I mean, honestly, a, a, a network is package-based, which means that it sends data packages. It's not audio, it's no audio signal at all. It's just audio data in a package, and it broadcasts from A to B. If it's corrupted, you'll get a glitch. That's it. There's no sound difference in the data package. But you want it to be shielded in order to block Wi-Fi from getting into your cable or Bluetooth or any RF signal at all. That, that's the whole goal of a network uh, cable, to keep it, from, keep it away from interference. But the shield needs to be connected to both sides. If it's only connected to one side, and a lot of cable producers still believe in shielding connected to one side to prevent hum, it doesn't work. Your shield will become an antenna. And an antenna is never a good idea <laughs> in an audio system, unless you want, I don't know, Radio Brussels to be broadcasting into your switch, that's possible. But uh, I would strongly suggest that, uh, against that. So the shield needs to be connected to both sides. And I'll get into that at the end of the presentation, because it's actually measurable. Well, you have different categories in cables. You have CAT5, CAT6, CAT7, and CAT8. And CAT means category. The higher the number, uh, the higher the speed it can handle over a longer distance. So it, it actually doesn't have anything to do with audio quality or cable quality in that sense. It's just a speed rating. So in most cases, CAT6 will suffice. And even if you take a shielded version, it will be better. I advise four shielded network cables. Uh, and there's different grades of, of uh, shielding. But if you buy a cable from, let's say, I don't know, any audio brand, it will probably be shielded uh, if they do their job right. 
and uh, it, it, I hope it will be connected to both sides. I didn't do any research about which brands connect shields to both sides and which don't. Uh, I only say it needs to be connected to both sides. And the reason I say it so many times is it's really important, this one. Um, well, this is an AudioQuest uh, Pearl, and you see it, it, this one is even triple shielded because every, um, every pair is shielded. Then there is uh, a foil and even a braided shield. So this one is triple shielded, and it's, it's a very nice cable to work with. Well, how to tweak a network for audio? Um, I can talk for hours about this because there's many aspects that have an influence on sound. Um, it's not the data. We have only managed switches at the office, and the, the, um, uh, the big advantage of running managed switches is that you can see packet loss. If you get close to the screen, you can see that tr the, the errors on the network are zero. And I measured for a month. So that, this is terabytes of data going through that switch, and there's zero packet loss. And in the early days of uh, cabling and switches, uh, some producers said, yeah, we have less packet loss or less data loss. Well, run, because there is no data loss, even with very cheap cables from China. And even very cheap switches don't have packet loss. It's, it's inherent in the, the whole Ethernet protocol prevents data errors. If they don't, the internet wouldn't work. Because if you download a file from America or Asia or wherever, the file will be there in the end. It can get slow but it will be there without any errors. In, in a streaming network, we're talking about maximum 10 megabits of audio data, and that's nothing for a network. It's really slow. But what does matter is that um, there is no interference in the cable. And this is a, a, a small story, because one of my colleagues said, there, uh, I, I do training in network architecture for businesses, and I didn't believe any of this I said yeah sound difference in network sure yeah okay well um, prove it and he said no just listen you'll hear a difference I said okay well uh, I didn't believe it so I said okay well, let, well we'll make a test it's cool so I made one network with optical fiber cable and one network with copper cable I said well, okay if there is a difference in sound we should hear it now because this one is fiber and this one is copper and there was a huge difference. So I had to admit my big mistake in not believing this uh, because there is a difference in sound. And both connections had zero packet loss. So I said, there is no data loss, but what can it be then? Well, it's all interference and mostly common mode, actually. Um, so I made, uh, with a friend of mine who is much better in measuring stuff like this than I am, uh, we made a test setup this is pretty technical. Are there any electrical engineers in the... No? Okay, I'm not one as well, but th this one was uh, pretty interesting. This is a very high-end measuring setup we built uh, with uh, very sensitive equipment because we're talking microvolts of common mode, but there is a difference in, in, in switches and in cables. This is like 40 grand in measuring equipment, so I can't afford it, but he had it in the office, so I was really glad he could do this. Because these are two switches, um, both audiophile switches. The left one is obviously less noisy than the right one, uh, and the left one it wasn't more expensive. Actually, it was a lot cheaper than the right one, which is 1,000 euros. Yeah, I was quite surprised as well to see this, like, holy moly, <laughs> what did they do? Um, the lower the noise, the better. And the reason is actually pretty simple. Now, 50 years back, hi-fi wasn't as good as today. 50 years back, we were playing vinyl and reel-to-reel -reel tape, and the noise is actually really high compared to digital audio. Uh, my new DA converter at the office has a noise floor of minus 160 decibels. It's one of the quietest decks in the world, and it's not the most expensive. 
by far. But if you're running at, let's say, minus 130 decibels, which is really good for a power amplifier, and you buy a decent streamer, which can easily t make that uh, noise levels, and you plug in your Ethernet cable with loads of common mode noise, what do you think will happen? The whole noise floor will go up. So your investment in really high, uh, high quality hi-fi gear is just lost at that point. It will block a little bit of common mode, but there's only one streamer in the world that I know of that is completely immune to switches and network cables. And that's the Grim MU1. It's actually here on the show, I think. Um, that's the only streamer. And the, the producers, did, they challenged me. They said, you can pick anything and you won't hear a difference. I said, okay, well, uh, challenge me, I like that. So I, I just grabbed cables and switches and I couldn't hear a difference at all. But that streamer is specifically developed to be immune. But all the LINs, the names, the, the, the sonnets, um, or relics, they all let me hear a difference in switches and cables. So they're not immune, which means that if you plug in a very noisy switch with bad cables, you'll get a, a less good uh, a musical reproduction. It's just a fact. And this was only two switches. We, we measured 10 of them. Um, and this is the impact of power supplies, which is even bigger than the switch itself. Well, even in a power amp or a preamp or, or, or a streamer or a DAC, the, the, the power supply is really important for the quality of the reproduction. And it's pretty, it makes sense if you think about it, because the only thing we do with hi-fi is modulate the energy we put in into air pressure differences. I mean, the DA converter creates a voltage, the voltage goes through the preamp, the preamp powers the power amp, the power amp powers the speakers, and the speakers make pressure differences. That, that's the thing we do with hi-fi. So the cleaner the power, the better the result. That's why power uh, supplies are so expensive because they need to be built really well. And it's hard to build a good power supply and expensive. But the cleaner the power, the better the result. And the, the left one is just a, 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 a stock switch mode power supply, which has a really big spike at the left of the screen. And the right one is a decent, not linear, but decent switch mode power supply. It's a lot uh, cleaner. Well, th this was with the really expensive setup. I don't have 40 grand on my bank account to buy equipment like that. So we have to do it with a little bit less uh, fancy equipment, but we're building a new test uh, to measure leakage in a switch. And it, the first results are quite interesting. Um, and again, not the most expensive one, it's not the best. Uh, it surprised me as well. But we can, well, get close to the results we had earlier uh, in terms of impact of power supplies and switches itself. And we, we put in very wide band, wide noise, and see what comes out from switch to power supply, power supply to switch, and between the ports. And there is a huge difference in performance. Of course, lower is better because that means the isolation is better and you get less noise in your streamer. And that's the whole point of testing this. Um, because I, I just wanted proof that there is a difference because there is a difference. And this is in between the ports, and you can see the yellow line is just a stock netgear, and it performed really well. And again, the yellow line is the netgear, and it performs really well. The other two, I actually don't know which one it was, but what struck me is that the high-end switch brands, like, like with Hi-Fi, you have high-end high -end brands, and with switches, you also have high-end brands. And like Cisco, they deliver all the switches for the main backbones of the internet. It's a really high-end brand. They build uh, their switches really well. And Netgear is a good brand for consumers and for professionals as well, by the way. And you see, they, they just know what they are doing. They know what they're building. They know what is important. And it, even more important, if you open up a, a high-end Netgear switch or Cisco, the power supply is completely isolated from the switch board because the radiation inside the switch will ruin the switching. And you can measure that because it's better isolated than all the, well, cheap brands, to, so to say. 
My conclusion so far, and you know, research always goes on, so maybe in three or four years, uh, I hope I know more about this than now. Uh, but so far, a good switch uh, does impact audio quality. And it makes sense if you think about it. Because the switching noise, uh, switching noise and common mode noise will get into your streamer, get into your DAC, get into your preamp. And it's, it's not a huge difference. It's not that the, your, your system won't sound good with a normal switch, but it will sound better with a good switch. That's the difference. Um, the biggest impact on the network is the power supply of the switch. Uh, and that also makes sense because cheap uh, switch mode power supplies have high noise. Unfortunately, but fortunately for us, the most expensive switches didn't perform the best. Also in our blind test we did two years back, the most expensive switch wasn't the best. And maybe they improved now, but uh, back then it wasn't the best performing switch. It was actually um, a Meraki, which is just a pro brand in the industry. It wasn't even built for hi-fi, but it was just really well engineered. <laughs> it's funny. And also the most expensive power supply wasn't the best, and th this struck me, but it actually also makes sense. Linear power supplies don't perform really well on switches. It's inherent in their design. And I talked about it yesterday with, with someone else, and uh, he said, yeah, well, a, a toroidal transformer doesn't filter. Well, it filters high frequency noise, but not low frequency noise. And a switch mode power supply, if designed well, filters a little bit better. And I could see that in my measurements as well. So just also try and just listen and trust your own ears because maybe uh, uh, one switch mode power supply will perform very bad in your system. But I strongly advise you not to buy stuff blind. Just try it before you buy it because my taste and my experience will probably, well, could not match yours, let's say it that way. Well, we talked about shielding, but I'm going to say it again. The shield needs to be connected to both sides with Ethernet cables. It's different from analog interlinks. And if it's shielded on one side, you'll create a big antenna. And the, uh, well, it will perform less well. Um, there, I, I created a story on my website, uh, Alpha Audio, uh, about, it's, it's a fun experiment. Who, who built their own cables once? Who experimented with own power cables or interlinks or even, um, I don't know, no one? It's pretty fun because you learn a lot from it. And building your own network cable is actually really easy. You just need a, 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 some good equipment and, uh, well, some patience because the first three ones will definitely not work out. But if you can build your own cables, and I did purely for experiments, I'm not a cable producer, I don't claim that I make better cables than all the other brands. Actually, I'm really bad at it, but I just wanted to know the impact of shielding on audio quality. And I bought, uh, uh, well, I don't know, 50 meters of cable, I uh, bought some shielding and some, some plugs and stuff. Uh, plugs don't matter at all in sound quality, doesn't, nothing. I couldn't hear a difference. And I tested 20 brands. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I still have my hands because it was a lot of work and painful work, but I couldn't hear a sing nothing at all. But shielding, I did. Clear differences, actually. Um, I made one without a shield, then I made one with shield connected to one side, one with connected to both sides, and one was triple shielded. And, well, unshielded sounded fine, nothing, okay, sounds great, good music. With co the shield connected to one side, I didn't hear any difference. I was like, okay, so it doesn't do anything at all. But with the version connected to both sides, the whole imaging was focused more. So that was clearly audible, and I think anyone in the room could hear it. The one with double shields, or triple m maybe even, I, I think that some will think it's too dry like with uh, uh, a deck that oversamples too much, it will get very precise, but a little bit analytical and, and dry. 
a dry sounding image. But uh, that, that was the difference in the cable for me. And you can try it yourself. It wasn't expensive. Just buy some plugs and some cable and, and some, sh some shield and you can test it yourself. And uh, I hope you get the same experience. Uh, the fiberglass, you can read it on my website as well. I, I explained all the things I bought. This one is tricky because the converters have a huge impact on sound. And it's not always better than copper. Because of the noise issue we had with switches and which we measured, we thought, you know, fiberglass will definitely be better because, well, electrical energy can travel through light. So we made a decoupling network with fiberglass and it, it, it sounded very different, but it wasn't always better. And the thing is, when we started experimenting, because some readers said, yeah, you can buy that converter, you can buy that module or that cable. The cable doesn't, didn't matter at all. I couldn't hear a difference in fiberglass cable, but the modules and the converters, they did. But this is really hard for people just like us that need to buy all that stuff. It will get expensive because you need to test every converter and every module and every combination because in the end I thought, oh yeah, this is better, but all the other ones weren't better and I had this much converters and modules that I needed to sell again because yeah, well, it gets expensive really fast. Um, and I'm not sure how it will impact your network and your sound and if it's your taste. So. My advice is just buy a decent switch from Netgear or Cisco or D-Link, buy a decent power supply, and I'm sure you will be amazed by the difference. But who is playing with their network equipment? You, everyone just plugs it in the router. Yeah? Wow, a lot of gain to be made here, I think. But the funny thing is, if you buy a switch online, it's 40 euros, a good power supply is 50 euros, a decent cable, maybe 20 bucks. So for around 100 euros, you'll have a huge upgrade. I'm pretty sure. So just try it, and uh, if it doesn't help you at all, you can always sell it. Uh, but with the fiber optic, it's, it's nice for me to know because I'm doing research, but it's, it's a whole different game. Um, so which sounds better? Well, it depends on, on the construction of your network and your system at home. Uh, I, I'm not really advised to use fiber. Uh, who uses Wi-Fi for streaming? Yeah. Uh, can I ask you which streamer you have at home? I have an uh, NAD M10. Yeah. Uh, NAD is Blue Sound. Well, it's the same module. And uh, what, what they do a good job, uh, by the way. I think Blue Sound is one of the better streamers in that price band, definitely. Um, but what, when I was looking, most really high-end brands like Orender and Meitner and stuff, they, they don't use Wi-Fi at all. And I think I know why, because it's really expensive to do it well. And you need to shield the radios and uh, uh, to prevent interference in the boards. And at that level, like ultimate, no compromise, you can't have anything in your streamer that's interfering with sound quality. And I asked Orender, why don't you use Wi-Fi? And why don't you use fiber optic uh, inputs? And they just said, it gets way too expensive to do it that well. And Grim Audio says the same. If we want to do it at that performance level, we need to do it extremely well, because if people use Wi-Fi, it needs to sound just as good as cable. Well, I agree. Uh, so most of the devices like the M10 or the Blue Sound Node or uh, Heos, it's for convenience. People don't want to drill holes in their walls to, to, to get a cable over there. And I totally get that. I'm crazy. I do drill holes in the walls and my wife doesn't like it, but I have a hobby. <laughs> um, the other thing with Wi-Fi, uh, it does get a lot better. But you can get interference, and it can get slow, and that's because of Bluetooth interfering with uh, Wi-Fi or uh, Wi-Fi interfering with Wi-Fi from the neighbors. And I'll show you what's in this building in terms of Wi-Fi, because I'm measuring it right now. In the 5 gigahertz, you have clear 
DALI uses the clear protocol and you have WISA. That's also five gigahertz, but it doesn't interfere with the other Wi-Fi because it's a, it's a completely different frequency. And that's, that's great. So don't be scared of using clear or WISA because it's a different uh, frequency band. So, in the end, to conclude, does Wi-Fi sound better than cable? No. Does it sound worse than cable? No. It completely depends on how they build it in the device. And if they did a great job, you shouldn't hear a difference. Uh, it's package-based. If they shield it, no worries. It will sound just as good. Uh, but it does depend. I, I, if you have the option, try both. Could be a difference. Um, if there are any questions, I'm still here. If you want to ask it now and help the others, maybe you can ask your question, of course, now.